turf. Or the well-organized army that devours everything in sight. My journey begins with the mass invaders. For sheer destructive power, the bugs with the worst reputations are the swarmers. But think about it. Why do insects swarm? It's actually an ingenious adaptation. If you organize to operate as one giant force, you'll increase your chances of getting what you need. Food, defense, and lots of sex. I'm checking out what's perhaps the most sexually enthusiastic invader of all. You've heard about it, maybe even seen it. But do you really know the straight facts about the periodical cicada? But something very strange is about to happen in this quiet suburb. For the insects, it's going to be the best debutante ball ever. But for some residents of University Park, Maryland, it's going to be a nightmare. Millions. In the yard. That's disgusting. <laughs> They're all over the ground. Ugh, I don't, a million of them is just, no, that's not cool. They're too large for insects. Those mm -hmm. beady red eyes. And the wings, I just, it's just gross. Periodical cicada nymphs burrow underground, trapped in solitary confinement, slowly growing for 17 years very slowly. In fact, they are the slowest growing and among the longest living of all insects. Their sharp beaks pierce tree roots, sucking up sap. It's like feeding for 17 years on a giant milkshake. This subterranean internment could also be the longest period of sexual abstinence in the animal kingdom. And after all those years, when the conditions are just right, they stir. Now the soil has reached 64 degrees. The nymphs crawl to the surface. The sun sets. It's the moment they've been preparing for all their lives. They burst from the earth. An invasion of billions. And the moment has arrived. We've got bugs. Now begins the march. The bugs are programmed to advance to the top of the trees. They'll cover this tree climbing up there. But it doesn't have to be a tree. It could be a a car, a porch step, or even my legs. It's during this two-day journey between the ground and the treetops when they're at their most vulnerable. It seems everybody likes to eat them. They're not camouflaged, they don't stink. They're squishy, delicious, and rich in protein. Once they find a safe spot, they shrug off the last vestige of their childhood. And timing is everything. You see, if they came out a year late, they'd miss the party. There was no way they would find anyone to mate with. You see, the genes for slack timekeepers never get passed on. When they emerge from their nursery shells, their wings fan out, their bodies turn dark, and their eyes glow red. And they are ready for seduction. But the strangest thing about this is 
Why wait 17 years to have sex? Maybe it has something to do with evading predators. Consider an entirely different creature. Wildebeest, for example. They migrate en masse every year. But their predators catch on pretty quickly, adjusting their schedules to take advantage of the bonanza. But cicadas come out every 17 years. That's a long time to hang around for a steady meal. No predators have synchronized their life cycles to cicadas. Sure, they're still devoured enthusiastically, but only as a special treat. Even if predators could predict the cicada's schedule, the sheer numbers of the bugs guarantee evasion. Billions swarm, many will be eaten, but most will survive to mate and send their genes into the future. And what a mating game it is. The males invade the top branches. They turn toward the sun. This raises their body temperature, prompting their bellies to vibrate like a drum. What sounds like a deafening racket to us is music to the female's ears. If she's interested, she'll come close and flick her wings. He sings, she dances. And then they mate. His postcoital reward is death. Well, she goes on to lay hundreds of eggs. Her ovipositor sports a razor-sharp, serrated tip, a handy tool for cutting slits into branches. She's carving a safe place in which to lay her eggs. Then she dies. Six to ten weeks later, the eggs hatch, fall to the ground, often into the molted shells of their dead parents, and the cycle begins again. But I'm not going to wait another 17 years to get a taste of these buggers. It's time to bite back. By timing their appearance to every 17 years, the cicadas can overwhelm even the biggest gluttons. It's pretty astounding when a swarm takes over your neighborhood. But what about the invaders that get into more personal turf? The kind that penetrate your home. New Orleans. Here it lurks below the surface. It haunts a town that is utterly unprepared for the onslaught. It devours. It multiplies. A giant organism programmed to chew. There's no telling when or where it will strike next. And if it wants your house, you are in deep trouble. David and Miriam Schulenkamp own a valuable Victorian home in the French Quarter. It's not just a nice house. It's an heirloom that's been in the family for a century. Now, it's under attack. You didn't need to put your ear to the wall. If you were in the room, you could actually hear them without putting your ear up to the wall. There were, there were millions of them in the walls. I mean, millions of them. There was no doubt about it. The Shulin camps had termites. Worse, they weren't just any termites. These were Formosans a voracious, invasive species. The local termite colonies are big, but the Formosans are twice their size. A million termites in one nest, and they seem unstoppable. They eat two and a half times more than the homegrown kind, about a thousand pounds of wood a year. Formosans come from Southeast Asia, probably hitched a ride on World War II cargo ships that were returning to Gulf of Mexico ports. They lay low for decades, chewing, infesting, 
eating whole buildings from the inside out, unnoticed, until the 1990s when the population exploded. Houses suddenly crumbled, support beams and roofs collapsed after being eaten away over the years. Who knows how long these bugs have been devouring the Shulin camp's house before they were even noticed. I looked up at the top of our 16-foot ceilings and it looked like mold and a lot of it. And I said to David, oh, geez, now what do we do? It looks like we've got mold. And he said, let's worry about it when we get back. So we went out of town and five days later, opened the door, came in, and there was mold on every single wall that faces the outside in the entire house. And on closer inspection, it was not, in fact, mold, but it was these little paths, and they were covered with, like, a powder. But you could actually kind of see through the powder, and then there were these little white heads. They, like, they looked like little sacks wiggling around, eating, 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 eating. Behind the walls, the mega-organism was expanding its empire. It's an efficient system where everybody has a role. Soldiers ward off predators. Workers set up house, take care of eggs, and feed the brood. Each colony supports one queen who can pump out over a thousand eggs a day. It's like having an intruder, kind of like a burglar, before you know it. They've taken a hold of your house. They were, they were stealing our house by eating it. People spend a billion dollars every year trying to eradicate termites. But it's a losing battle. To even have a prayer of success, you have to think like a detective and carry the tools of a bomb squad. Yep. You're on the, on the Termite port, expert Ed Freitag meat. shows me the typical devastation termites leave in their wake. They, they eat. What they do is they eat the softwood yeah. and the lignin, which is the part that is not very nutritious. They leave that, and that's what you got in here. So they've, they've already had their dessert. These are just the leftovers. Then he shows me how he hunts down the elusive gluttons. Infrared cameras can track their body heat. Microwave sonar equipment eavesdrops on the termites every movement. Boroscopes with tiny lenses penetrate their hiding places. This is the kind of party that was going on in the Schulenkamp walls. Pest control manager said that he'd never seen such a fast, voraciously eating group of termites. But the real trick for pest control was to find the source. They finally discovered it in the bathroom. They had nourished themselves with the water from a small leak in a bathtub drain. Termites thrive in wet habitats. It was here, under the bathtub, where they found her. The queen. A writhing bag of eggs. And the brood that lives to serve her. Every day that went by, she was churning out at least another thousand babies. Pest control told the Shulin camps they had one chance to save their house. The tent. Tenting is the last line of defense when all else fails. It's like a massive hazmat suit, but one that traps the deadly infection inside. Then, methyl bromide blasts into every hole and crevice. No human is allowed to enter for three days. This is all-out war. After weeks of anguish and tens of thousands of dollars, the Shulin camps finally rescued their family home. But there's no telling how long they'll be able to keep the bugs at bay.